five minute countdown, like five six one, and then Q and A time, and then like ten minutes Q and A, and that's amazing. Oh, over there. Yeah, that's weird. Oh, okay. You'll do great. You'll do great. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're just going to give it another minute to just have people um, uh, come in. Now it's on. Hello. Testing. Hello. Testing. Okay. Testing. Probando, probando, uno, dos, tres. <laughs> are we live online yet? We are. All right, folks. <clears throat> well, bienvenido and welcome. Uh, my name is Rafael Bejar. Uh, I'm the director of outreach for the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, joining us as we celebrate and honor Tejano Day. While Tejano Day is new, uh, it was just designated by the Texas legislature in the last session, it, Tejano families have been living in Texas since 1731, uh, so for a very long time. And April 6th was chosen as the date, as it marks the anniversary of the first Texas Declaration of Independence in 1813 from Spain, uh, which was authored by Don Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara. Uh, unfortunately, that independence, that first independence, was very short-lived, um, just for a few months, when the Spanish army came in and defeated the Tejanos at the Battle of Medina. Uh, and uh, Medina, the Battle of Medina is known as the bloodiest battle in the entire history of the state of Texas. <clears throat> However, that desire for independence was not crushed. And just 20 years later, the Tejanos joined with the Texians to declare independence from Mexico. There is much more to Tejanos than just delicious Tex-Mex food and lively conjunto music. While it's impossible to relate 300 years of Tejano history uh, in the very short program that we have, we did want to uh, highlight some of the stories and some of the impact that Tejanos and Tejano culture have had on the great Lone Star State. And uh, with that, we have assembled a very um, a august uh, panel of Tejanos uh, and uh, I want to start by introducing our, our very special guest, uh, Mr. George Benavides. Uh, he is uh, the family genealogist and historian for Gregorio Esparza, one of the Tejano patriots that died at the Alamo. Um, and uh, he was born and raised in Bevo, uh, Texas, married to his wife, Marianne, for 40 years and has two children, uh, grew up living next door to his uh, grandparents and would listen to stories from his maternal grandmother <clears throat> regarding major historical events, such as the Battle of the Alamo. And, be, and that began his love for history and genealogy. In researching his family history, he uncovered the fact that he is a direct descendant of Alamo hero Gregorio Esparza, who fought and died at the Alamo, and a descendant of one of the first families of the Canary Islands who helped establish what is now known as San Antonio. He graduated from A.C. Jones High School in 1976, received his associates in law enforcement in 1978, and received a bachelor's in criminal justice from Southwest Texas University in 1979. Um, he is also the first Hispanic and first president of the Alamo Defenders Descendants Association, first vice president of the Canary Islanders Descendant Association, and a member of the Sons of the Republic of Texas. So welcome, George Benavides. Next, we have my good friend, Art Martin Savara a prominent attorney in San Antonio uh, and noted uh, author of Tejano History. Um, and as a matter of fact, he has brought one of his books, and this is the Tejano Patriot. I'm going to give it a little plug here. Uh, Revolutionary Life of Jose Francisco Ruiz, another Tejano Patriot, and that is uh, 
uh, a book that he has penned uh, and is a very comprehensive history of this very famous Tejano patriot. Uh, Art is uh, assistant, uh, aside from being a uh, general uh, attorney uh, for the Martinez Nevada Law Firm, he's assistant general counsel for the Republican Party of Texas from 2016 to the present. He was chief of staff and general counsel for Texas State Senator Connie Burton um, and uh, Texas is 10th um, uh, senatorial district uh, during the 84th legislative session. He is the former mayor of the city of Von Norme. Uh, Van Orme has the distinction of being one of the few cities that has zero property tax. Um, so he's a patriot in that sense as well. Uh, and uh, he earned his uh, bachelor's in arts and history from the University of Colorado, Denver, and a master of arts in systematic theology and doctor of law from St. Mary's University, and a master of arts in history from Sam uh, Houston State University. Art is a 10th generation uh, Texan, Tejano, descended from the Mission Espada Indians and Spanish settlers uh, who purchased a portion of the mission uh, in 1792. So welcome, Art. And then we have our uh, my illustrious uh, colleague, uh, Joshua Trevino. Uh, he is Chief Intelligence and Research uh, Officer here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, and prior to that post, he was vice president of strategy at the Illinois Policy Institute in Chicago. And prior to that, he was vice president of communication here for TPPF for six years. He served both as a speechwriter and an international health professional in the administration of President George W. Bush. Uh, he is a veteran of the United States Army, where he was an officer. And his Tejano has, uh, ancestry stretches back to the Escandón colonization of Nuevo Santander, in the 1750s. And one of his founders, uh, one of his ancestors is Tomas Sanchez, the founder of the city of Laredo. So welcome, Josh. And to moderate our discussion, we have the uh, very distinguished honorable Maida Flores, uh, who is a uh, distinguished senior fellow here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, Maida is, of course, a former uh, Texas U.S. Congresswoman from uh, Texas's 34th Congressional District. Uh, she was born and raised in Burgos, Tamaulipas, Mexico. She came legally to the U.S. at the age of six with the help of her father and grew up working alongside her parents in the cotton fields in Memphis, Texas. She graduated high school in San Benito, Texas, and earned a bachelor's degree from South Texas College. She's a proud U.S. Custom and Border Protection um, uh, wife and mother. And she also recently found out her family history, and she also is a very proud Tejana, and she is descendant of Martin de Leon, founder of the city of Victoria, Texas. So welcome to all our panelists, and uh, we're going to start with this very interesting and historical uh, discussion on the impact of Tejanos. So Maida, please. Thank you so much for that introduction. George, let's start with you. Okay. <laughs> Tejanos, who are they? Where did they come from? And when did they arrive? And how has the term Tejano been broadened over time? Well, the word Tejano actually was given to us by the Cato Indians. They actually, um, Anyone that's a Tejano is someone that's been here prior to it becoming Texas in 1845. So you have the Spaniards, you have the Mexicanos, you have the Mestizos. Um, anyone that was here before then uh, is considered the Tejano. That and the Coahuila, Texas region area is the region of the Tejanos and so forth. The, the entire time, I thought all my family was from Burgos, Tamaulipas, Mexico, and I started asking my, my father questions, and, and he told me that my grandfather was actually born in, in Rojando, Texas, and my great-grandpa was also born here in Texas, and I found out that I come from Tejanos. There you go. <laughs> so it was, it was amazing uh, to find out my roots, uh, and my roots are here in, in Texas, Art. As a historian and noted author, 
What were some of the most important impacts of early Tejano history? Its contribution to the American Revolution War of Independence and the formation of the initial Texas Republic? That's a long question. I know. <laughs> um, like George said, the, uh, uh, the term Tejano is a uh, evolving identity. You know, right. at the very beginning, it's a, it's a Spanish word for Texas, comes from the Caddo language. And so the original Tejanos were just the inhabitants of Texas. And then as, as uh, you know, history uh, unfolds and, and new peoples move in, especially Americans and Europeans, it becomes an ethnic identity to describe those who, who uh, have this Spanish mestizo background who kind of predated that wave of immigration. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's important to understand, you know, who, who the original Tejanos were. Uh, and it's surprising to most people when they realize how few Spaniards actually immigrated into the area, right? So the, if you find a Spaniard in Texas or on the Northern frontier, uh, make a note of it. It's a very rare situation. Nearly everybody is uh, what's termed uh, contemporarily as a casta or somewhat of mixed race. Uh, there was this long hierarchy of castas from from uh, uh, Spanish born on the Iberian Peninsula being uh, at one level and those of pure Indian or African ancestry at the other and all kinds of colorful terms in, in between to describe people. Uh, Texas was a frontier, uh, maybe akin to contemporary with the way we think of uh, the, the far north of Alaska or, or Guam or something of that nature. So it wasn't like people were flocking to Texas in its early years. In fact, um, in, in in my book on uh, on Francisco Ruiz, there's there's, a, there's a, an account where Ruiz is the presidio commander uh, of the Alamo Company, and uh, one of the officers gets put on, on on trial, and his punishment is frontier service, which is his current assignment. And so, for many, it was a punishment. Um, and, and for others, uh, uh, it was uh, a place where they're born. And and so the Spanish used, used various methods to entice or to bring people into Texas. One was the soldier settler model, where they would assign you to the frontier. You, you would bring your family with you and then hopefully plant roots and then, then multiple generations would, would evolve uh, that way. Uh, there was quite a bit of, of mixture with the local indigenous population. Again, there's very few single Spanish women moving into the frontier, so that's a reality. Uh, and what we, one of the th unique things about Tejanos that you, you experience is uh, there's only about 200 founding families in what we call the, the greater Northeast, which is Nuevo León, Coahuila, Tamaulipas, and Texas. Of course, the modern international boundary divides that, but there's roughly about 200 founding families, and nearly everyone is a descendant of those 200 founding families. In contrast, uh, colonial New England has about 1,600 founding families. So there's this great impact of, we, we term a founder's effect. And you see it in many aspects. You see it in physical traits, characteristics, interrelatedness. If you ever do a DNA test, you'll find half the room is related to you. Uh, and even like surname commonality. So uh, the example I always like to use is, is the surname Garza or De La Garza, very common name. Open it. I don't think they have yellow pages anymore, but if you look at the yellow, white page, you'll see pages and pages of Garza. Garza is one of the rarest names in Spain, one of the rarest names in all of Latin America, but it's hyper concentrated here because of that founder's effect. The same with the commonality of other surnames. So because of that, uh, I think that, that the Tejano population here kind of laid the foundation of what eventually evolved into Texan culture, right? The ranching culture, the cattle culture, uh, this this idea of, of, of this constant blending that occurred from the very beginning. Uh, a term we often use uh, is ethnogenesis, right? We see specifically in the missions here in San Antonio and, and in East Texas, uh, the, the, the consolidation of what had been previously very distinct indigenous ethnic groups meld together. Uh, and then with the secularization of the missions, those populations melding into the Casta Tejano or, or, or Mestizo uh, Tejano population to the point where it becomes this new thing, this Tejano identity uh, that uh, you can't trace to one origin. You can't say these are Spaniards. You can't say these are Mestizos from the Valley of Mexico, or you can't say these are indigenous Texans. They're this new uh, ethnogenesis, this new identity. Um, and, uh, and again, they laid the, the framework and the foundation of, 
of modern Texas. I personally went back over a hundred years and realized that my family has always been here in Texas before it became Texas. So I encourage everyone to, to ask questions, to ask your, your father, uh, where is he from? Where's your grandpa? I, I really think that it's important for us to know who we are and who uh, we come from. I think uh, it helps us find, find more about who we are today. I just want to say on, on that note there, I don't know, I forgot to mention that the Cotto was actually, you know, the Cotto Native American tribe that gave us the name Tejano and Tejano. It actually means friend. And that's where they were considering us friends back then. And that's where the word came from. But you're right. You need to ask people. Um, basically, that's basically how I learned through my grandmother, you know, was asking her questions and finding out who I am and, and where we came from. And she would always have sayings saying that we didn't move, the border moved. You know, we were here before Texas was Texas, which when I do the research, it came out that, yes, my family got here in July the 9th, you know, 1731 from the Canary Islands in Spain. 85 people started, 60 people made it here because they ended up in Veracruz and one of the, the ships did not show up. So they walked from Veracruz, Mexico, uh, to San Antonio, Texas, walked in on July 9, 1731. That's amazing. So when people tell me, go back to Mexico, I'm like, no, I'm from here. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> we, all my family has been from, from Texas. And uh, now that I know that it's been over 100 years that my family has been here, I'm like, no, this is exactly where I belong. <laughs> um, well, George, back to you. The Alamo is full of myths and legends. Tell us of the Esparza story. Who were the Tejanos at the Alamo and what were some of their heroic stories? You know, my fourth grade grandfather was Gogorio Esparza and he was one of the seven Tejanos that fought and died for Texas. He um, born and raised in San Antonio. He married my fourth grade grandmother, Ana Salazar. She had already had been married before uh, to Victor Castro who passed away in 1825. Um, she then married Gogorio and they had three more boys, Enrique, Manuel, and Francisco. Um, when the Alamo was coming about, and he had a brother, Gogoni had a brother by the name of Francisco, who actually um, was a soldier in Santa Ana's army. So it was two brothers fighting against each other. Um, when the battle started on February 23rd, 1836, um, they went ahead and went. They were going to leave San Antonio, but unfortunately, the wagon that they were going to take wasn't ready by the time Santa Ana showed up on February 23rd, 1836. So they made their way over to the Alamo, and he had told his wife, Anna, my fourth grade grandmother, to go ahead and leave with the kids. And she says, No, if you're going, we're all going. So they went to the Alamo, were in there. Enrique was eight years old at the time. He was the oldest of the boys. Maria de Jesus Castro was 12, which was the daughter of Victor Castro and Ana Salazar. The battle happened, and uh, unfortunately, Gregorio died and was killed there at the Alamo. But he was the only Alamo defender to have a Christian burial. And it was because Francisco asked Santa Ana for the body of my fourth great grandfather and gave him a Christian burial at is what is called Campo Santo, which is actually Ben Milan Park now. There's a plaque there with his name on it. So he's the only Alamo defender to have a Christian burial uh, from that battle. After the Alamo happened, everybody went their separate ways. Um, the family went to go live with Francisco, who actually um, was his brother in Santa Ana's army. They stayed in San Antonio. Later on in 1855 um, and 56, the uh, heirs, that's when they were, um, they petitioned for the land to, for his father's uh, service into the Texas army. Uh, Gogorio was part actually of uh, Palacio Benavides regiment company of the American army. And he was actually, they were actually on their way to Goliad to go with Fannin and so forth. But then for whatever reason, they sent Gogorio back to San Antonio. And that's when 
the battle started and he was killed and so forth there at the battle. Um, Little is, um, was known until the Dollars Republic of Texas um, was researching, trying to come up with information of the Alamo survivors and so forth, because there were survivors. A lot of people in our days would think that it was only Susanna Dixon and Angelita were the only survivors of the Alamo. They were the only white women that survived the Alamo. There was 23 women and children that survived the Alamo, and most of them were Mexican women, Hispanic women, um, that were married to men. Des Smith married a, a Mexican woman. Jim Bowie married a Mexican woman. So when they came here, there were no <laughs> women except for Hispanic women, Mexican American women that they married. So <clears throat> after the battle, um, everyone went their separate ways. And it wasn't until 1902, uh, the story goes through family uh, history, is that they were going, there was a reporter by the name of Charles Merritt Barnes. He was doing a report at San Antonio Express News, uh, looking to do a report about the Alamo. And as he was there at night doing this report, the, there was a custodian, uh, a Hispanic man, said, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm going to try to write something about the Alamo. And he said, well, why don't you just go talk to Enrique Esparza? And he goes, well, who's that? And he goes, well, he was at the Alamo when it fell. Like, what? They thought everybody had died already. You're talking about 1902. Alamo happened in 1836. They thought everybody's gone. Well, unfortunately, Enrique was still there. He was living in La Soya, Texas, um, south you know, of San Antonio. And they went um, and interviewed him. And what we know today, a lot of it is given, uh, should be given credit to Enrique because he's actually the one that said, this is where Jim Bowie died. This is where Davy Crockett died. This is where this person died and so forth. So he was able to give them accounts because they were in the Alamo. The Esparza family is the largest family to survive the Alamo with six. Ana Salazar, uh, Maria de Jesus, Enrique, Manuel, and Francisco um, survived the Alamo. They were inside there when it fell. Um, so when they, when they um, found Enrique to interview him, they went ahead and um, got all this information. And there's a quote that they asked him uh, if he remembered, because, you know, he was 74 years old when they did the interview in 1902. He goes, you asked me if I remember. It's endeavorly seared into my brain, nor age or infirmary will ever let me forget the horrible sights that I saw that day. So for an eight-year-old boy to see his dad get shot in the head, stabbed in the, sh in the chest. It was probably pretty, uh, you know, uh, terrifying at that time. This is why I think it's so important for all of us uh, not to just assume our family's history. I think it's important that we take the time to reconnect, not just with our parents, but also with our grandparents. Like I said, I, I thought all my family was from Burgos, Tamaulipas, Mexico, and I come to find out that most of my family is from here, from Texas. And I think it's important that we find out the history of our families and the impact that they had um, back in those in those days. And we'll realize that our, our families fought really hard for us to be in the positions that we're in today. Um, and not just our families, but many other families. Um, we hear stories, like the story that you're sharing, but believe it or not, all our family has its own story. And I think that it's important that every single one of us share our, our family stories and, and the impact that they had in us and, and in Texas as well. I think, Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. I always tell people that uh, history, especially the family history, the oral history, is like a conveyor belt. We all get on the conveyor belt at one time or another uh, when we're born, but once you drop off that conveyor belt when you die, whether it be your grandparents, grandmother, whoever, that history goes with it. So this is the time for you to ask your family, start digging, asking questions, because once they're gone, it's gonna be very hard to, to get that information. Very true. Josh, 
let's bring you into the discussion. Texas statehood and the Mexican-American war marked not only a shift of attitudes towards Tejanos, but also began the blurring of Tejano and Mexican immigrants. Tell us about some of these dark days and how Tejanos were able to persevere and provide impact on modern history. You're asking all the uh, the small questions here. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's 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 interesting what happens after statehood. Uh, and as my colleagues here on the panel have talked about, uh, there's really uh, it's it's a heterogeneous population group that ends up becoming the Tejanos. And so when we get into the statehood period post 1845, um, uh, you've got you you, really, you have to think about it as kind of three historic settlement groups. There's uh, there's the folks out in El Paso who were really part of the New Mexico colonization and Oñate and folks like that, um, not even in the same time zone, right? So, 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 so we'll set them aside. Uh, uh, then, then you have obviously the uh, the Canary Islanders and the San Antonio settlement, which is pretty distinct. And then the last uh, real wave comes uh, with uh, sort of what's now like the Nueces Strip settlement. So this is Nuevo Santander, which uh, kicks off with Escondón and his colonization in the 1750s. Uh, and that's, um, uh, as, as far as I've been able to discern, that like that's where my family is from, Pro probably yours too, actually. So we should talk to so we'll probably, uh, hola prima, uh, good, uh, good to see you. Uh, but, you know, so 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 when this comes along in, in uh, 1845, it's, it's really important to understand the extent to which uh, basically from the Texas Revolution uh, through the 1920s, uh, the end of the Mexican Revolution, uh, the political identity and sort of the civic identity of, of Tejanos, Mexican Americans in South Texas, is an incredible flux. And so, in a single human lifetime, less than a century, uh, you can have someone uh, who actually, as I'm sure all four of our ancestors did, probably many of you in the audience as well, born to the sovereignty of Spain. They become Mexican for a few years, then they're, they're they, they may be citizens of the Republic of Texas. Uh, if they're up in San Antonio, if they're not in San Antonio, they might have been part of the Republic of the Rio Grande, they might have been Mexican again, then they were probably, uh, you know, under American uh, sovereignty. And so and so it's such a just a terrific the dizzying array of, of, of sovereignties that pass over South Texas in particular and this Tejano population. And so as a consequence, you had this really late uh, sort of coalescing of civic identity among Tejanos. Um, uh, which which had some very negative effects. Uh, I don't think there's any there's any getting around that. One of the of the negative effects actually was sort of the dissolution of this old porcion system uh, that really prevailed, particularly in uh, in in Old Nuevo Santander. So uh, some of this still exists. But the idea was that after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, which really definitively passed all the land north of the Rio Grande uh, into U.S. sovereignty, one of the articles in the treaty was that the United States, and by extension, the state of Texas was going to honor uh, uh, land ownership that um, uh, that uh, was was established under both Spanish and Mexican rule. And now, uh, you know, I, I descend, as I'm sure all four of us do, from significant landowning families. Uh, in, in my case, the one I've done the most research on is the Ramirez is of uh, modern day Roma, Texas. If anybody's been to Roma, I don't know why you'd go to Roma, but uh, it's got a nice it's got a nice plaza. And one of the very old grand houses uh, in Roma was actually built by my uh, four-time great-grandfather, Juan Lino Ramirez, uh, and his son, uh, Juan Antonio Ramirez, back in the middle of the 19th century. And he had uh, tremendous swaths of ranching land in South Texas, as did many other of the uh, kind of these original families. Uh, and, and it is true, there were only a handful of them, actually. So you see the names over and over and over again. Well, my, my assumption, and, and the assumption actually of almost everyone that I talked to, at least within my family, was that over time, uh, these lands were lost because um, uh, kind of the line goes uh, that, that, that we were cheated out of them by the Anglos, that the, you know, that, that the Anglos came and, and uh, used lawyers and law and, you know, kind of the cover of, uh, you know, predatory prosecution to strip all this land ownership. And that's, that's, you know, that's kind of the received mythos, especially when you get down in that area of South Texas. Well, what's interesting is that it turns out to not really be necessarily true. Uh, some of that did happen, uh, no doubt, but uh, th there's a historian over at um, Texas A&M, uh, whose name I'm suddenly forgetting, but come, come to me later and I'll Google it for you. I just don't want to do it on stage here. Um, but uh, he is a South Texas historian. He's Tejano. 
And he actually did a lot of work looking at what happened in land ownership in South Texas. And it turns out that the state of Texas actually did in the decade of the 1850s, make this very good faith effort uh, to send commissioners down to South Texas to confirm all of the Mexican and Spanish land titles. But because the local population of Tejanos did not feel that this sovereignty would last, because again, they'd been through a new one almost every decade for the preceding half century, uh, a majority of them simply did not participate in the confirmation of the land titles. And so as a consequence, when later litigation came, as actually did happen to the Ramirez's uh, in the early 20th century, um, there was no confirmatory title to a lot of the land. And this, this results in this dissolution of wealth. So you see this happen. You also see kind of a general civic sense, uh, and, and, and this is multi-causal, that uh, if you're Tejano, you might be formally a citizen of the United States, you might be a resident of Texas, but your political allegiance or your social allegiance is not necessarily to the state of Texas. Uh, and this all changes in the decade 1910, 1920. Uh, we could have a whole other uh, kind of confab on this, um, uh, but the very short version is Mexican Revolution kicks off in 1910, and this is sort of the last gasp of um, this, this almost this irredentist uh, Mexican claim to South Texas and the uh, and, and the Nueces Strip. This is, there's this really crazy plan in 1915 called the Plan de San Diego. There is a San Diego in Texas. It's one stoplight. Uh, but these but, but, but these Carrancista revolutionaries uh, gather together there, and they really were supported by um, uh, the Carrancistas in, in Mexico at the time, one of the eventually the winning faction in the Mexican Revolution. And uh, and they essentially declare a race war. They're going to wipe out the Anglos out of South Texas. They're going to start a revolution. They're going to do this and that. And I think they they, they, they derail the train. I believe the Rapa Bank is, is basically as far as they get. And what ends up happening is that is that the the, the Texas Rangers um, uh, come down on them with with an iron hand. They deputize a lot of people that they shouldn't have deputized, and there's essentially this very sanguinary and, and in many cases horrific counterinsurgency that's waged in South Texas from about the 1915 to 1920 period. Um, a lot of innocent people are killed, uh, a lot of them by the Rangers, uh, but it's it's, um, it's it's the nature of the border. So what ends up happening? This is the point that I'm getting to to answer your question. Uh, and there's a great book on this called Revolution in Texas by a guy named Benjamin Heber Johnson, uh, whose politics I don't agree with in any respect, but I do like this book, uh, so you should read it. Uh, and, and, and he makes the case, which I think is affirmed in a lot of other documents, that this is the period in which the, 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 the Tejano population, the Mexican-American population, really casts its lot with the United States makes a kind of a collective political decision, I won't say unconsciously, but it's not like there's a meeting where this uh, ends up happening, that uh, it is it is only the United States, not Texas, but the United States, that will guarantee the rights and privileges and dignity of the population at hand. And there's a really, I'll close with this, there's a really fascinating uh, diary, if you haven't read, it's the, it's the World War I diary of uh, Jose de la Luz Sainz, uh, who ends up um, coming back from World War I and founding uh, LULAC, I believe. Uh, and uh, and so he's he's a school teacher in Cotula, which is a little bit outside our sphere. But you know, Cotula is a gas station uh, at this point. But uh, at the time, it, uh, it it was it was a small, uh, mostly uh, Tejano farming town between Laredo and San Antonio. And uh, in in his diary, he's 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 a school teacher, and he's called up to the army to fight in World War One. And it, it's he, he reproduces the note that he leaves on uh, on on the schoolhouse door. Um, and, and it's a great note. You should go look it up. But uh, at, at the end of the note, he, uh, he says he's fighting for the dignity of our people. He's going to go fight in France uh, so his students can fight at home um, for, for the rasa, uh, as he terms it. And, and he ends it with Viva George Washington, Viva the Stars and Stripes. Which is which is a definitive signal that that uh, that that the future of Tejanos, the future of Mexican Americans in South Texas, is with the United States. And this is all so recent and so new and candidly so radical uh, at his time, but it sets the stage uh, for what comes next. And nowadays, you know, we see uh, in South Texas, it is an area where there's a disproportionate um, uh, incidence of you know volunteering for military service. For example, uh, if you go to the uh, uh, Museum of South Texas History, they've got a whole little wing dedicated to the memory of uh, Freddy Gonzalez, who were in the Medal of Honor at Huey in 1968. Uh, this sets the stage uh, for what comes next. So th 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 there's a lot more to it, but I guess I'll stop there and you can take this where you want it to go, Myra. Yeah. <laughs> well, we hear all these amazing stories, but I want y'all to know, um, those watching us, those here, that we all have a story to tell. And it's so important that you share your story, but that you also share your parents' story, your grandfather's story, I think that that is the best way we can pay tribute to them, to our family, um, and keep their memory alive. Because I believe that every single one of us in our families, 
may, had an impact here in Texas or wherever. And we are here today because of them. So the best way to pay tribute to our families is by talking about their stories. I just wanted to take the time to all of you. Thank you, George, Art, Josh, for taking the time to be here to talk about the Hano impact, past and present. All of you here, thank you so much for joining us. All of you watching, thank you for joining us. It's so important that we continue talking about the Tejanos and the impact that they had in, in Texas. But I encourage you to talk to your parents, to talk to your grandparents. It's a good way to reconnect. And also, those of you, talk to your children as well and tell your children your story because I thought I knew everything about my mom and my dad. And because of this conversation, I found out so much about my parents. So I encourage you to do the same. Again, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. Anyone here have any questions? If you do have a question, uh, Erica will bring you the microphone and our only ask is that you phrase it as a question. Thanks. Uh, my name is Israel Avila. I am from West Texas. Um, my father, Pablo Avila, just passed away a couple of years ago, but he told me when he was born and he was growing up with his father, Juan Avila, that he was born in Ojinaga, Mexico, which is just south of Marfa, but he was born from a gentleman, well, I'm not gonna say a gentleman, but a person that fought with Santa Ana. He was an officer for Santa Ana. When he was born, his wife passed away, she died. He said he did not want that child anymore. Now, is there any, um, the name Estorga? Does, does anyone up in the panel know anything about Estorga being in the, in the Santa Ana? I do not, I, I don't know if either of the two of you do, but uh, but, no, but, but I will no, no. say, and I think we can all attest to this, there is a ton of resources out there, especially these days. And so I think any any one of us would be happy to kind of provide you with some of the folks that we've talked to through resources, if you wanna. It would be great. Yeah, he uh, he gave away his, uh, my gran grandfather and a family, Avila family, took him and they went to, to Barstow, Pecos Barstow area. <laughs> I would also note that uh, Santa Ana had many, many armies. He came mm -hmm. in and out of power, dozen times so right if you're focused on the texas campaigns and you don't find the name there's a lot of other resource a lot of other campaigns and other armies that he led it may also be have been a different one right okay but don't Thanks. stop digging that's yeah. that's amazing yeah it's, yeah uh, it's pretty you keep on you keep on digging trust me you'll you'll find something <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Uh, yeah, I, I I actually would encourage you to uh, continue digging with that. And and at the at the Junto de los Rios area, which is Ojinaga Presidio, uh, there was several military colonies uh, there at that point. So it wouldn't be unusual uh, for your ancestors to have ended up out there, especially if they had prior military service. We we just had my, my grandmother, who's ninety and uh, uh, still she'll be ninety this year, is still alive. Has said for years and years that we had a Mexican ancestor who served in Zachary Taylor's army. Uh, which I thought was wrong. I thought, yeah, grandma, that's not wrong. He's Mexican. Why would he serve in Zachary Taylor's army? Well, I found out recently that she was right about it. Um, uh, he actually did serve as a muleteer when Zachary Taylor came down after uh, Angostura, after the Battle of Buena Vista, and uh, ended up getting sentenced uh, to uh, hard labor in Veracruz uh, for several years for betraying Mexico. Um, so, so all of which is to say, if you hear the, if you hear those stories, they're probably true. Yeah. I also want to say on that note, is uh, you need to look into an uh, organization called Los Bajaleños. They're a genealogy uh, organization. They're in San Antonio, but they do pretty much all of Texas, and they've got tons and tons of research. Anyone else have any more questions? I have one for Rafa. Hi, my question is for um, Art, for you or, or Josh, and if you could expand a little bit more upon the connection between the Tejanos and the American Revolutionary War and what contributions the Tejanos actually made to the independence of America. And then also, um, you know, uh, further down the line, Josh, you spoke about um, uh, 
the pride of uh, participating in U.S. military. And that actually goes back before with Tejanos fighting on both sides of the Civil War. And, you know, and I don't know if you know any of that. If maybe you can just, you know, to, uh, you know, expand upon that for the, you know, for the uh, education of our audience. Sure. So during the time of the uh, American Revolution, um, obviously, uh, Texas was a colony of, of, uh, of Spain. Spain did enter the war on, be, on behalf of the uh, colonies, the American colonies. And so there were uh, Tejanos uh, who contributed both as, as military service and as supply uh, uh, su uh, supplies to the Continental Army. So I guess the most infamous would be uh, uh, Bernardo Galvan, the namesake of Galveston, uh, who led a, a company and fought in, in Florida and Mobile and those kind of areas to assist uh, uh, the Continental Army. Uh, but there's also a long list of, of ranchers and farmers and even some of the mission communities who donated cattle and other supplies. Uh, they, would, they would drive the cattle to New Orleans in that area and then, uh, and then ship it over to the, uh, to the Continental Army. So uh, there, there was a quite extensive network uh, uh, from the Spanish colonies, but particularly in Texas, that did aid the revolution. And I guess I'll speak to the uh, Civil War part of it. Uh, pretty interesting. You know, we talked about earlier, like the contending sovereignties across South Texas. The Confederacy was yet another one. And, uh, you know, kind of contrary to a lot of the, uh, I would say, oversimplified uh, war between the states narrative that we get these days, uh, it's it's confounding uh, to a lot of the recipients of, the, of that narrative to know that the, that the Confederate cause was actually relatively popular among South Texas Tejanos. It's not that it was a clean break. There were still plenty of uh, Tejanos who served in the Union cause. But the preponderance of those who served uh, did serve in gray, and it wasn't just because uh, they happened to be in Texas. You've got uh, local heroes, Santos Benavides, who um, successfully defends Laredo from uh, Union invasion in 1864. Uh, and we also have to understand that it was a cross-border phenomenon, too. Uh, one of my uh, very distant relations is Santiago Vidori. Um, uh, Melissa Ford and I talked about him on our podcast. Um, go watch our podcast called The Hard Country at TTPF. Uh, but uh, he was governor, uh, kind of the Caudillo of Nuevo León, and uh, and also incidentally Coahuila uh, at the time, and uh, actually tried had a the subordinate scheme to detach northeastern Mexico uh, uh, from Mexico and attach it to the Confederacy, uh, and so and so we see this um, uh, and, and and we see this 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 military service over and over, and I think the common thread that goes through it uh, is is a defense of the home and locality that you get throughout whether it's in uh, the Mexican War, whether it's in the, the incidents around the Republic of the Rio Grande, there's a sense of rootedness in South Texas and a real sense of belonging uh, in South Texas, that this is the place that you are and it's the place where your ancestors have cast, cast their lot. Um, that's, uh, you really only find it in a few other places in the United States. I'd say, you know, parts of the South and parts of Appalachia uh, are, are, are basically it. So it's something qualitatively unique and it expresses itself in history over and over again. Uh, just to pick up a little bit of what Josh says, uh, it's, it's very true. Uh, you know, a lot of people project modern, you know, nationalities onto these colonial or, 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 or pre-national uh, eras. But in those times, uh, you know, there wasn't this cohesive thing of, say, a Mexican nation. There was no Mexican identity uh, in the colonial times. Uh, in fact, even within the Spanish empire, there wasn't a common Spanishness, right? So the, the informal title for the king of Spain was Rey de las Españas y las Indias, in the plural, the Spains and the Indies. And so each province viewed itself as autonomous from other provinces, but with a common monarch, which was a European kind of phenomenon. So, so, so in, in, in Texas, so uh, for example, Francisco Ruiz, uh, in, in much, much of his correspondence, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an incident where uh, the Gutierrez McGee expedition is at the gates of San Antonio. Ruiz is a royalist officer, and he's negotiating over uh, covertly over over lines to 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 assist the revolution and to peacefully take San Antonio. And in it, he he uses the term "mi patria" over again, my my homeland, my my my. my but he's clearly referring to Texas. He's not referring to New Spain or Spain or this or this thing that doesn't exist yet, this nation of Mexico. And so, uh, uh, speaking to Josh's idea of this rootedness in South Texas, I think there was this. Even if it was a, 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 a maybe less developed, but it was a, it was this idea that their homeland was here in Texas, and so you, you know you see similar language from you know like Robert E. Lee and stuff when he's talking about I will fight for my homeland. He's talking about Virginia, not necessarily 
the U.S. or the Confederacy, and so you, you see that as well. Um, uh, my family's experience during the Confederate War, I think, is, is fairly interesting. They there was a lot of uh, uh, avoidance of the of the of the 1862 conscription laws uh, in in Bear County, uh, and so the the state legislature passed an alternative service statute for Texas state troops. Uh, they formed a, a military company uh, as a, as a mounted uh, cavalry unit. They they show up for duty. They tell them, "No, we're going to make you infantry," but you don't take a horse and a, and a rifle from your Tejano. So they they disband the unit. They join the regular Confederate Army. They end up at Glorieta Pass in New Mexico in the New Mexico campaigns, which is one of the biggest blunder disasters. It's, it's a wonderful battle if you like uh, Civil War history. But what's interesting is afterwards, uh, uh, the supply their supply train was burned, and so they couldn't continue. And the the commander told them in, "Well, you know, we're we're stuck. We don't have you know." San Antonio is, you know, 800 miles into the, into the sun. Good luck. And uh, the majority of the Anglos traveled directly back to San Antonio across Comanche territory. Roughly 80% didn't make it back. Uh, the Tejanos instead went into Mexico. They, they went south to El Paso and went, uh, you know, uh, went an indirect route, ended up meeting up with uh, Colonel Benavides and Laredo, and uh, all of them survived the war. So, um, they, uh, but they, they agreed to serve uh, to protect the frontier. They would defend the homeland, they would defend Texas, but they didn't want to fight in a foreign war in Virginia. So this idea of Tejano as your, as, as your patria has deep roots. Y'all talking about this, y'all just actually reminded me that a few months ago, I was in King Ranch. Most of you, I'm sure, uh, know of this uh, ranch here in Texas is in Kingsville in Claypore County. And it was very interesting what they, were, what they shared with me. They said that when King Ranch was being built, they actually went to Curias Tamaulipas, which is minutes away from Burgos Tamaulipas, and went to go purchase cattle. And once they purchased the cattle, they actually invited them to come to move uh, to uh, King Ranch and help them build the ranch. So hundreds of families from Burgos Tamaulipas and Curias uh, moved to King Ranch. And I, I thought that was a amazing because that's where, where I'm from and I just have come to find out that we're all connected one way one way or another again thank you so much for taking the time to be here all of you as well god bless you yeah we had two more questions but that works too whatever works right is the panel interested in two more questions sure possibly yes yeah, more yeah. Questions. after this I have to go back to work so please continue continue the question okay um, my question pertains to um, the panhandle of Texas, um, and what was going on with respect to the natives in the period of the American uh, Revolutionary War, um, in particular with respect to um, George Washington and General Long's um, victorious victory up in um, uh, New Jersey. It's so, do you understand my question? Um, not the connection, but I, I can certainly speak to the what was going on in the panhandle during the session. Yeah, so, so the reason my question being is that um, my grandfather came to um, Texas and worked the um, uh, with the harvest of wheat from Texas all the way up into Canada. He was part of the thrashing team and in uh, 1923 and uh, he goes back to my great 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 grandfather was one of the troops uh, that survived the battle of the Hessian troops and it was awarded land and for um, his service and uh, up in um, the land he was awarded was is in um, well was in York, Pennsylvania. So um, he wasn't one of the marble headers, which were the rowers of the boats, but he was one of the troop. I mean, one of the battle soldiers, <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, he survived. So, um, and I know about our native. I know some about our native ancestries in the tribes, both in um, the East, Southeast, but I don't know, I was born here 
in Texas. Um, and I, I don't know a lot about the, um, the connection of why my grandfather would have come to Texas in 1923. Um, but I know it was because of the Lord God Almighty who brought him where long um, in the family of God Almighty and as Christians. So does that help? Yeah, so uh, so the, the, the Texas Panhandle is one of those areas that, um, especially in the, in the early colonial times, was claimed by European empires, but to say that they effectively controlled it uh, was, was kind of fanciful. So it's, you, you often see these maps that says, you know, Spanish America, and it goes all the way, you know, up to Canada or whatnot. Um, the, the, the closest area of settlement was, you know, the New Mexico, Santa Fe, that area. Uh, one of the important uh, events that happened there was the Pueblo Uprising in, I think, 1681, uh, which is one of the few successful indigenous uh, uprisings against uh, European colonialism. And they, they kicked the Spanish out of New Mexico, uh, and they retreated down to El Paso. And one of the main things that happened there was the Spanish left behind a tremendous herd of horses. And up to that point, uh, there really wasn't a dominant uh, indigenous population that controlled and could breed horses. And so the uh, uh, the Comanche, who had learned horsemanship, again, working with and, and uh, under the oppression of the Spanish, but also uh, with, with, in alliance with the U Indians, uh, gained possession of a majority of that, of that horsehood herd and moved it onto the what is now the Texas Panhandle along the Canadian River. Uh, and essentially what, what many historians term created what they call a Comanche Empire, right? They were the dominant um, political entity in that part of the world. And they would trade and deal horses with the other Plains tribes uh, uh, up and down uh, you know, in that, that part of America. That in effect displaced and pushed the Apache who had kind of previously been involved uh, 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 occupying that area further southward word, and began the, the, the conflict that you see in, in, the, in, in colonial Texas between uh, uh, settlements like San Antonio and then, a lot, and then the Escondón settlements with the, with the Apache kind of encroaching in on that area, themselves being pushed by the, the Comanche behind them. Um, and it becomes a tremendous area of conflict. Uh, and so yeah, I don't think it's until, you know, after American statehood where there's a, there's a, um, a concerted effort to uh, to uh, take possession of those lands uh, in terms of the Indian Wars, right? There, there's there's a series of forts that are created, you know, Fort Worth all the way down to uh, to, to Laredo, and then, and then it keeps getting extended further westward until it's ultimately, uh, uh, you know, the, I think the last Comanche uh, group is under uh, Quanta Parker, uh, accepts uh, or uh, gets defeated and, and moves on to the reservations and in, in, into Oklahoma. And that opens up the Texas panhandle to uh, settlement. And so it, it's it's not long after or not long before this 1923 time frame. So it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a whole new world, right? That this this Indian threat has been removed. Uh, and of course it's it's uh, uh, it, it opens up to, to cattle raising and oil exploration and all these kinds of things. So it's this area of, of a mad Russian. But that, that's why certain areas of the state, such as the Panhandle, have a uh, don't have as quite of a long history of, of permanent settlement, and it's because of that Comanche Empire and that presence that took a very long time uh, to, to be defeated. I think we have one last question. So my name is Linda Gonzalez Avila. I'm also a Valley girl. I'm from Alamo, Texas. My question is: You often hear Tejano and Chicano used simultaneously. I'd like a definition for Chicano or Chicana from trusted sources, because you can Google it, but any idea why they use both of them or what do they, can you define Chicano? I want to give my opinion last because I do have one, but please. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I have an academic source, but my understanding was Chicano comes out of a, the a, a, it started as a pejorative of Anglo farm owners mimicking uh, uh, their farm workers, uh, calling themselves Mexicanos, so they call them Chicanos, and that during the civil rights era, like a lot of pejoratives, it was turned into a sense of 
pride. Uh, and I think you see a lot of ambiguousness about the term in Texas because it's a California term that's kind of brought in through certain political and, and uh, you know, other movements doesn't necessarily originate here. So many people don't necessarily um, affiliate with it. Uh, but that's my understanding of the origin of the term. I actually like that description a lot better than the one that I had in my mind. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Did you have one? I was going to just agree with Art that exactly that. I think it was just brought in and people, you know, their own terms, whether it be Chicano or, you know, Tejano is what they preferred. But I think here in Texas and South Texas is the Tejanos. If you really want the last one, just on a side note, the term Latino also has ambiguities. I mean, the term Latino was coined by the French when they decided to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, invade invade Mexico. <laughs> they had to create this political theory of why it's okay to justify it. And they went back to the, the idea that France and Spain have a common Latin or Roman origin. So if you're Latinos and the French are Latinos, then you don't you wouldn't mind having a French emperor imposed upon your country, so they they termed it all Latin America, and so I you know I have relatives in Mexico who take offense to the term Latino or Latin America because it's a term of imperialism. I have I have a little different view. Uh, I don't I don't disagree with any of the factual basis of what's been said uh, by my colleagues, but look, the, there's no such thing as the Chicano. There's no such thing as the Latino. We're Tejanos, Hispanics, Mexican Americans. Take your pick. Chicano, uh, whatever the etymology of the word, and I think you're, I think that's right. I think it did come from California farm fields. Uh, was instrumentalized and elevated in the 1960s and 70s by a specifically left wing political class that wanted to create a politics of grievance around Hispanic identity, principally in California, and then it spread to certain intellectual circles, primarily in San Antonio here in Texas. Very unrepresentative of the community as a whole, candidly, in terms of politics, society, you name it. Latino uh, was uh, gained currency in the United States uh, after circa 1980, mostly because the Los Angeles Times unilaterally decided to use it in their style guide after Chicano failed to get much traction. So as a rule of thumb, this is not 100% true because there's going to be a few exceptions. But uh, if you see somebody these days describing themselves as Latino, they're probably Californian. It's not us. Uh, and if you see somebody describing themselves as a Chicano, uh, they're probably progressive activists, uh, either from California or San Antonio. So I look at it as a strictly political marker, and uh, honestly, Chicano especially uh, have a lot of objections to. Um, there is there there is a lot of cultural baggage that's attached to that, including the idea that we in Texas are basically descendants of Aztecs, which is completely false uh, and. Um, we should have nothing to do with it. So thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> I actually think you, you're you're right. Uh, a lot of my family that that is from Mexico and that live in South Texas, um, they actually disagree with a lot of these terms because it puts them all in one box. So they're like, no, we're we're Mexican Americans, or you know, we're not Latinos because I think a lot of people in America think that that when they think of Latinos, they think of people from Mexico. Right. And it's not true. It's people from all over Latin countries, Central America as well. So my family likes more of Mexican American versus uh, Latino or Hispanic because it's like that's not describing us who we are. So, yeah, you're actually <laughs> you're actually right. We're on the same page. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. God bless you.